Dr. Kennedy has a degree in biochemistry and physiology from the University of Kansas. He went to the University of Missouri at Kansas City Dental School. He's been in the U.S. Navy Dental Corps. Um, he's now retired, but was in private practice since 1973. He's an international lecturer and author. President, past, is it past president preventative health? Or current president? <laughs> Uh, Preventive Delth, Dental Health Association, past president of the IAOMT, also a master in the IAOMT, and currently the IAOMT Public Relations and Fluoride Committee. Please welcome Dr. Kennedy to the podium. I'm actually going to talk about a whole potpourri of uh, subjects, including Perio, uh, a, a program called EndNote uh, 10, uh, FMDA uh, response and a little bit about fluoride, probably not of that order. And I also want to make another announcement that uh, Janet uh, didn't know about, is that after the forum today, we're going to have the premiere of a new documentary called Poisoned Horses. It's the first segment of the second four-part DVD on fluoride, and it's the story of uh, uh, Kathy and Wayne Justice's horses who became severely, uh, actually died, from uh, water fluoridation in Pagosa Springs. You know, on Hardy's slide the other day, he showed that altitude affects the uh, effects of fluoride, uh, it enhances them, actually, it devastates them. And so, uh, where did you read in the uh, advocates for fluoridation that, uh, like Denver, mile high? Now, how did they adjust that uh, level of fluoride to water? Oh, they didn't. Pagosa is only 6,700 feet high at the airport. So it's not that much different. So anyway, you'll get to see how things work out. Um, we've talked uh, extensively uh, this uh, weekend. Uh, uh, Tom Baldwin, uh, across the, uh, the hall here are uh, some tremendous assets with uh, Bill Landers and uh, Jim Harrison about the, uh, the organisms and, and so forth that, uh, that we can identify with a microscope. And, it, and, and I just have to say that, that it is by far the most enjoyable aspect of preventive dentistry because there was some incredulity among some of the new uh, members of the academy that if you treat an infection, it goes away. And I tried to draw some analogies between sexually transmitted diseases like mm, syphilis. If you treat it, it goes away and you don't have it again until you contact somebody that has it. That kind of went over their head and, you know, infected fingers. And <laughs> And that at the end of the presentation, a, a nice young uh, lady who's a member of our academy came up to me and she said, you know, Dr. Kennedy, uh, I was a hygienist before I went to dental school. And uh, I really appreciate you sharing that information with the class because, boy, it really drives my practice. <laughs> People like to get well. And uh, talked to another dentist. He said, oh, I turned that, uh, turn that over to the hygienist. Well, that's great, except your hygienist didn't go to the IOMT, didn't graduate from one of our accreditation programs doesn't know how to identify the organisms. And so you, it'd be like me flying my uh, airplane into, into uh, Timberville, which is my next stop, and uh, I crash into a mountain and smear it all over the place and burn down a few houses. And the, and <laughs> the FAA comes over and say, how come you, you ran into that? And I said, well, I turned that over to my uh, assistant. And, uh, you know, she fell asleep and uh, didn't recognize there was a mountain. They said, well, who's the pilot in command? Oh, that would, that would have been me. So, that as the owner of the business and the doctor, that the responsibility always ends up on my shoulders to make sure that the care that's rendered in my office is state of the art. So, yes, I, I had two hygienists. I, they couldn't get it done in a day without two of them working full time. So, that's the engine that drove the practice because everybody flocked from miles around to come stop that infection that other people wanted to cut off. So anyway, today, you know, all the evidence is abundantly clear that the organisms in the mouth attack the rest of the organs in the body, including the babies and the, the create oral cancers. Pancreatic cancer is the newest one. My mother died of pancreatic cancer. Um, and, and diabetes are some of the new, the new aspects of it. So I just thought I'd mention that so you would know that there is life after dentistry, is that, is that you can stop dental disease, both tooth decay and gum disease, and I'll get to tooth decay. I know Hardy talked pretty much about in, in the uh, 
uh, brushing your teeth with cheese, and I think that's a good idea. But uh, we also have some very effective ways to kill Streptococcus mutans. And that's, that's, the, that's the bad guy, that's the sticky gooey guy, and that's the one that's causing the problem. And so why does 90% of the adult population in the United States have periodontal disease? The answer is they're brushing with fluoride. That you, inflammation is the fundamental cause of bone loss. And so if you put an inflammatory agent on the gums continuously, then you make the bone go away. Fluoride destroys bone. And that, these little guys here eat blood. So the spirochetes go in, and, and if you can't identify a spirochete, you've never seen a snake. <laughs> and, the, and these are the nastiest little organisms known to mankind. Every species of spirochete does something horrible to humans. I mean, think about it. You've got Treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis. You've got Treponema dentinum, which is what they call this guy. They got, they got uh, Ehrlichiosis, which is a spirochete that lives in the mouth of a tick. Uh, and you know, I could go on. There's dozens of them out there. All, they, they, some of them are misnamed. Even Heliobacter pylori, if you look at it, it's a snake. I think they named it wrong. They should call them snakes. What is it, all this Treponema stuff? Just call it snakes, because the minute the patient sees that, they're jumping out of the chair saying, how do I get rid of that? Well, you know, you can get rid of it with baking soda and salt, and that's what the young lady reminded me. I have a tendency to be more of a nuclear dentist. I don't want to fool around, kill the little things just as quick as I can. But on the other hand, baking soda and salt works just fine. <laughs> so that's, that is my home care uh, uh, regime for all of my patients uh, who have any uh, uh, desire to have healthy teeth. And baking soda neutralizes acid, stops tooth decay, salt. These little boogers can't live in salt water, so you know the idea of the game is to give them plenty of salt water to try to live in. Dehydrates them. You know how you went to the ocean and you swam around for a while and pretty soon you got out and you look like a prune? Well, they don't have skin to keep from looking a lot like a prune. So that's why salt tends to kill them. Some people put peroxide in there. Peroxide is the more irritating of the ingredients. Paul Kais, I know, recommended peroxide. However, we have a, a, an exhibitor here that uses ozone. You can ozonate olive oil, or you can ozonate uh, uh, a number of the herbal uh, oils. And I, uh, uh, Oksana talked uh, last time about using the oil of oregano. Well, you can ozonate oil of oregano, and all of a sudden you have a, a mild, soothing oil that nukes spirochetes. Why does it nuke spirochetes? Because they can't stand oxygen. Well, you know, we can. So now we have the ultimate biological weapon against microorganisms that has never harmed a human being. Don't inhale ozone, I'm not saying that, but if you dissolve it in some other media, then you can apply it to these guys and they choke to death because they can't stand oxygen. And if you're watching this screen here, you've noticed that in the upper part of the screen, there's a spirochete that eats its way inside a red blood cell. They survive on your blood. So if your gums bleed, any time I do a new patient exam and I'm going around with my explorer looking for caries in between the teeth, I don't do a periodontal probing until I've disinfected the gums. And that in the process, if it bleeds even at all, I stop touching the gums in any way after I take a little biological sample, and I'm gonna find these guys, because these guys make the gums bleed. Sometimes there's some other guys, but I can almost guarantee it's gonna be these guys. So they're easy to kill, get busy and kill them. You'll really enjoy it, because people are tremendously happy afterwards. One of the things that uh, Dr. Leinbach forgot to mention is the fact that there are studies from a pediatric uh, dental schools, Dr. Lopez in Puerto Rico, where they have a terrible problem with baby bottle tooth decay, and they also have a terrible problem with money. So they don't get to go to the hospital and get a, a fluoride inhalation anesthetic and all their teeth ripped out. And so Dr. Lopez, a, a pediatrician, was looking for a way to stop tooth decay. So she used uh, three different levels of fluoride and one of povidone iodine. And what she found was 91% of the kids were caries free in a year, whereas only 54% of them with a four part per million fluoride application were caries free. Well, you know, if one part per million fluoride was gonna have an effect in water, then you'd expect it to have an effect here. But look at the 
protocol. They dabbed their little front teeth. There's little rabbit kids, you know, they're one year to two years old. They had four teeth, and they dabbed them every two months with a little flash of iodine. That's not that hard to do. It doesn't have to be done in a dental office. You can teach a mother to do that. They might even want to do it every day, as long as they didn't let the baby swallow a lot of iodine. But, you know, if they did, that would make their thyroid stronger and counteract the effects of fluoride. One of the things that Hardy, uh, Hardy forgot to mention is that the, the National Academy of Sciences have determined that an infant that's deficient in iodine, that a level that's 250% lower than they receive from fluoridated water, suffers thyroid damage. I mean, that's a study that Kathy Thiessen actually quoted and wrote in the endocrine thing. And that I have that letter, I didn't show it this time, from the Department of, uh, of Consumer Affairs uh, Dental Division in California that says that the health effects of ingested fluoride are not within the purview of the dentist. So we are perfectly legitimate in destroying the child's thyroid. It's not in our purview. On the other hand, uh, when the mother finds out that we've dispensed a non-FDA approved drug through either the water or through tablets and uh, ruined the child's IQ, because that's what happens. If you lower the thyroid, you increase their risk of cancer, heart disease, and lower IQ. So it's not really a very good thing for us to be doing to our patients. And that, on the other hand, we can use something like uh, this, this uh, particular study used povidone iodine, which is iodine with an ammonia group hooked to it. You can do the same thing with uh, potassium iodide. Uh, we've, we've looked under the microscope after using potassium iodide or Lugol solution, which is 50-50 iodine and uh, iodide. And uh, so I said it causes inflammation. And so here's a, here's a, a, a drug, the Sepicor, uh, that has disclosed to the FDA the, the concentration of fluorides from their products, like fluoridated toothpaste and mouthwashes, aggravates the G proteins in the oral cavity and promotes gingivitis and periodontitis, and that's in their application for the drug. So when you recommend that your patients go out and brush with one of these fluoridated toothpaste, and there they abound, the, the whole issue of fluoride is a scam it is a falsehood, it is untrue, and they have relied upon your reputation to promote it. It's recommended by 150,000 dentists. Well, why? Because their misinformation about it abounds. It is the largest single case of scientific fraud in the history of the planet. Because there has never been, as Hardy pointed out, any good quality studies showing that ingested fluoride was of any benefit whatsoever. That's why they are now down to the theory that topical fluoride is of some benefit. Well, wait a minute. You know, Socrates, the guy that got to drink the hemlock, the, the terrible crime that Socrates committed that made the politicians want to kill him is the fact that he taught his students how to differentiate between opinion and truth. And he says all evil in our society comes from opinion. And that truth comes from God. I think plural, gods. That it's immutable, it never changes. What is true is always true. It's not true today and not tomorrow and then true the next day. It's always true. And that the difference between truth and opinion is that opinions change like the wind and truth is there forever. So let's look at the fluoride issue. Is it true that it works when swallowed? No, <laughs> that, that opinion changed. Is it true that it's been proven safe and effective? Three different court cases in three different states determined that it was not effective. Aggravated existing illnesses, increased the cancer death rate. Well, I guess that's not true that it's safe and effective. So here we go, flipping around like a flag in the wind in a hurricane. That's where evil enters our society. And it gets worse than that. People ask you, ask me all the time, he says, well, Kennedy, why are you so excited about fluoride? And the answer is real simple. Is that if I allow my country and my countrymen and my children of my country to have their IQ damaged by an ignorant profession, by a scam using our good name 
and using money laundering through the, through the various dental associations where industry gives the associations money to go out and promote a flawed program, then I can't call myself a patriotic American. Amen. Amen. And that it's up to us to turn the tide on this scam. And it will not stand the light of day. It will not stand scrutiny with any kind of scientific acumen. And after this meeting, I'm going up to Timberville, where they have supposedly lined up an advocate for fluoridation who is willing to be on video. <laughs> you think he might end up on YouTube fairly soon? And since we're talking about killing those little germs that are around your teeth, one of the things I want you to know about those little germs is that they're swimmers. And that you can't hurt them, so if you get the dental floss and you can't hurt them with dental floss because they're like cats. They go wherever they want to. So you have to change the water that they're swimming in. They swim in gingival curvicular fluid. So you got to change that to something that they don't like swimming in. And so one of these dentists that heard the lecture, uh, this is actually uh, from Europe, Sweden, and uh, one that heard the lecture about how these guys are really bad and how they're swimming around the teeth and they're eating, eating all the bone and all that stuff, decided that he was going to kill them, but, you know, he doesn't want to use all those woo-woo things like salt and baking soda and saliva and oil of oregano. So he got out his, uh, his uh, fluoride solution. And, and went around and irrigated it and looked, at, you know, looked under his microscope. Yeah, it, it, well, it didn't quite kill them all. But what happened is the jawbone sloughed. Fluoride is excruciatingly toxic to bone. What does your body do with fluoride? It parks it in the bone. Why? Because if it doesn't, you're going to die. It sucks all the calcium out of your bloodstream, so your heart quits beating. A lot of kids die under uh, general anesthetic for dental care, and they say, well, you know, it's cardiac arrest. They must have had a congenital defect or something. But what did they do? They ripped out a bunch of teeth, and they did a topical fluoride treatment and let the kid swallow it because he was under anesthetic, and his heart stopped. Yeah, well, that's too bad, because he's getting anesthetic through his nose. I, I had a, a problem with my kidney a number of years ago, and they were going to snatch out a stone. And I told the urologist, I said, uh, let's get that stone out of there. And by the way, I don't want anything with fluoride. And his eyes went down to the left, up, went around the circle, and came back, and he said, so we're talking a spinal, right? Because <laughs> all of the anesthetics that you inhale, halothane, fluorothane, are fluoride anesthetics. And Hardy very correctly pointed out that inhalation anesthetics give you an enormous dose of fluoride, especially if you're a kid. So anyway, don't, the take-home message is keep the fluoride off the bone, off the gums, and out of your lips and that I'm going to make the Academy uh, provide us with bottled water at our next meeting or I'm going to shoot somebody. No, I shouldn't say that. As Texas, I could. <laughs> Especially if they were looking in my house. <laughs> okay. And uh, so one of the things that happens is that uh, in Nor Norway, they've recently banned the use of mercury fillings. And the reason is because of uh, this lady right here. And that basically she got on the program and kept after him, and they kept saying, well, it's just a little tiny bit of mercury. It's, just, it's not enough to have caused this lady to be in a wheelchair and unable to stand and walk and talk and so forth. And then they did a study, and yeah, I guess apparently it was. But she ended up on TV, and that was, that was a good thing, because they understood that not only her, but 450 dental assistants in Norway, of that, 70% of them tested impaired. Um, so it's a huge amount of information that we've pumped out for you guys to, in the last uh, 24, 48 hours. And if your brain is as fried with mercury as mine, that it may be a little difficult for you to remember who it was that uh, first discovered, uh, you know, that mercury's bad for monkeys, or mercury's bad for sheep. And, you know, like, when was that published? Where was that published? And so forth. And one of the things that I have found very useful, and it is free, if you don't get the full program, but you can use it just like I do, it's called EndNote. And I use EndNotes, and that in our response to the FDA, we used footnotes. EndNote doesn't make any difference. It's just a term. And so let me show you 
EndNote. So I'm going to have to let's see if I can push that and EndNote. Okay, so this is EndNote, and you say, "Gee, it's got the names listed by author." Okay, well maybe I'd rather maybe I remember the year. So I click on year, and it lists them by year. Well, that's good. So so let's see who's the first one in here. I remember there was one something back in 1926, and if I forget to put the year in, oh, here's 1940, 1541. That's Paracelsus. Got to tell you a quick story about Paracelsus. I never can remember how to spell his name, so I go right here, and there it is. That Paracelsus was so busy killing his patients with mercury that they made up a, a nursery rhyme about him. Know the nursery rhyme? Rubby dub dub, three men in the tub. Who do you think they be? You can finish it. They're all gonna die. <laughs> Turn them all out scot free means they're gonna die. The kids made up nursery rhymes about the men that he was trying. Why is it only men? He was treating syphilis. He put them in a tub of mercury chloride, and they died like flies. And his colleagues said, Paracelsus, stop! doing that. You're killing these guys. And he says, dosus solum winem facet. Dose alone makes the poison. Everything is a poison. And it's the dose that makes it so. Well, you know, Paracelsus, the dose you were giving these guys was killing them. <laughs> and I've encountered this same expression, dosus solum winem facet, so many times with the fluoride issue. Oh, it's just a little tiny bit. Oh, it's only 250% greater than is shown to cause harm. When do we quit poisoning the baby? You know, this is, you know, it's not logical. But you know, it's like that's why my buddy Boyd Haley says that, that uh, he feels like he's been in a ten-year argument with the town drunk. So, <laughs> sorry, Boyd, I stole your line. But uh, it, it really is almost that bad. And so you go down here. Oh, then we had all this stuff back here and, and uh, there, and we've got. Uh, well, what's this one from 1926? It says, the dangerousness of mercury vapor, and it's got a name like Alfred Stock. Who was that? Was, oh, that was the head of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute in Germany, the most prestigious position in Germany at the time in science. Oh, well, you know what the ADA says. Well, he's a junk scientist. He doesn't know what he's doing. And, and here he, he details out his experiment where he blew his own breath into a leather bag and got 10 parts per million mercury in the bag. And he, I mean, this is not easy work. He's a, a fantastic chemist in 1926. And he blew his breath in the leather bag. Why leather? He knew mercury went through rubber. We were with Cal OSHA the other day. They didn't even know that. That's why in the IMT protocol, we put the vacuum under the rubber dam as well as above it, because mercury goes through rubber. Dr. Stock knew that in 1926. Blew his own breath in the leather bag. He knew there would be moisture in his breath, so he used a desiccating agent in the bag that sucked up all the moisture. And then he distilled the remaining air through a distillation column. It was brand new glass tubing. Why brand new glass tubing? Because he knew mercury would stick to a, a soap. Anything that was in that tube, so brand new glass. And it came down to a little tiny pipette that he dropped it on a calibrated microscope. He actually had a microscope that had a, a ruler on the back side of it in. Uh, angstroms or whatever, some tiny measurement that he probably knew and I don't, and was able to use calculus to calculate 10 micrograms per cubic meter of air, or 10 parts per million mercury in his own breath. The EPA standard for the air outside today is 0.3. So he found 30 times in his own breath that level of mercury, and that's 1926. I get hoo-ha all the time on my video smoking tea because the dentists say it's water vapor. Well, one thing, you can't see water vapor under uh, 253 angstroms of light. That's atomic absorption, a well-established principle. And for the other thing, the tooth is dry. We dipped it in the water to heat it up, and then he dried it and held it in front of the screen. The follow-up on YouTube is The Beautiful Truth, where Roger takes his pocket knife and scrapes it, and the mercury comes off and falls down. They don't like that because mercury does go toward the floor if you don't have a hot hand with the air rising around it. And then he went and stuck his fingers in hot water 
there on a glove, rubber glove. He's sucking hot water and holds it in front of the screen and says, see, no mercury. So anyway, that's on, that's on YouTube, and these are the, these are the fun things that uh, we can show you. Um, anyway, this is an English translation of Alfred Stock's work. Somebody sent it to me, and what I did, I put it in this database, but you see this little thing over on the side? That's a PDF. And so I can go down here and say, well, let's see, I'd like to print this out for my friends and family. And down at the bottom is a link to a PDF. And I double click that, and that brings up Adobe After That, or in this case, this antique computer brings up Preview. And Preview is basically the Macintosh version of Adobe Acrobat, or I could start Adobe Acrobat, and now I've got an Acrobat. What, is, what does PDF mean? It, it, portable D digital file, PDF, portable digital file. So I can attach this to an email and send it off to Roberto Villafania or Jeff Green or any of my friends and say, hey, you remember Dr. Stock in 1926? published in the peer review journal. You know, and, and let me point out to people, peer review does not mean journals with ads in them. So if you open up a journal and it says, we're a peer review journal and you should buy Denley's and you should buy Denmat and you should buy this and that and there, that is called a trade journal. And they may pretend to peer review, but everybody in science recognizes that if you have a true scientific journal, you do not sell your soul to industry, which is kind of what's happening there. So anyway, that's, uh, this is EndNote, and that uh, maybe you'd like to know what uh, studies that the IMT has done. Maybe Vimy would be an interest to you. So you type in the name Vimy, and there's all the stuff that either is Vimy or quotes Vimy. What do you mean? Well, here's one called Mutter. What is that about? Well, that's 2005. And so I just was talking to Veris High School yesterday, and, and Dr. Mutter used to be an electrician, and that his mercury fillings made him sick. Well, why? He's around high tension electricity. It sucks more stuff out of his teeth. He got real sick. So after he got well, he went back and became a physician. And he keeps writing these absolutely marvelous summary articles of what's wrong with mercury putting, what's wrong with implanting a time-release mercury filling in somebody's mouth? And this is his 2006, he has a 2005. He lists gobs of references. You can see it just goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And he links it to, you know, stuff like autism, uh, perinatal exposure, skin allergies, infertility, multiple sclerosis, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And well, maybe you like that, and you'd like to read that sometime when you're drinking a beer or smoking a cigar. And <laughs> you can double-click it. You can go down to the PDF version of it and print it out. It's the link to the PDF right there. So you can print it out, play with it, manipulate it, and if you got the full version of this, it, it, oh, he only used 247 references, and you know it hasn't been proven. So you have to, have to have more references than that to prove something. And I love the dentist, you know, it's like water fluoridation, and you get, it, you get in there, the, the guy that's got, he's still got his clinic coat on, and it's got, you know, a little impression material on it, and a couple of bloody fingerprints and so forth. And he gets up and he said, it's been proven by thousands and thousands of studies. And I said, great, give me one that was broad-based and blinded. He said, I'm sure they're out there somewhere. <laughs> put him in court, and he goes like, I, did I say that? I, I don't remember saying that. I'm, I'm sure that somebody did that, so anyway. It's a, here's a occupational exposure to amalgam during pregnancy. That's what Guzzi has to say about that. And the interesting thing about this program, this, this is all available to the members of the IMT. You can download the file, put it on your laptop, put it in your computer at home. And then when you want to tell somebody about infertility, you type in the key word like pregnancy or infertility or something like that, and stuff like this starts popping up. British Medical Journal, occupational exposure to mercury during amalgam, amalgams during pregnancy, and apparently it doesn't work out that good. So I hate when that happens. And you can get the whole PDF right here, or you can go to the British Medical Journal, go online, and that's from 2008. So you can 
download that. It's a marvelous program for all of those of us that have impaired memory. Uh, it, it's actually on a, on a, uh, a thing called uh, an iDisc that is, 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 the I, is, is, I'll give you the URL uh, when I figure out what it is. <laughs> it, it's actually the IMP iDisc, but it's, it's so big that you can't really email it around. So the iDisc <coughs> is one that you can download from, and so you go there and, and that, uh, it's, it's not up there right now because we're working on it. But it, when I get home, which is be after the 15th, I'll put it back up because we recently come in contact with quite a few more PDFs that we're attaching. It's really easy. Here, you got a reference you, you, if you had a PDF. As a matter of fact, let me say that to anybody here is that when you get this database, if you go through it and you see that I have a reference in here for like, uh, you know, blood lead concentrations and the method of water fluoridation, and I don't have the PDF in there for that, send me your PDF. Just email it to me and I will attach it to the appropriate study. Jim Love has threatened to send me 10 boxes of Mike Ziff's uh, papers, which will uh, add considerably to this database. Uh, at the present time, uh, there are 785 references in mercury alone, and that we have mercury fluoride and perio. <clears throat> and I've separated into three different uh, categories so that it's easier for you guys to find. So um, let's look for another thing. How about F and D A? Oh, there's the I M T F and D A comment, and it's put together by Jim Love and myself and Bob Reed. We took uh, uh, Steve Corral's uh, a scientific response and mutilated it, and uh, Rich Fisher, and that uh, with their uh, excellent help, uh, we were able to uh, put together, uh, and I'm proud to say that I got a call, or an email actually, from Boyd Haley, I can call, and, uh, and he said that <clears throat> he's been really busy lately, like a cat on a hot tin roof, but when he started into this, pe this uh, response, couldn't put it down. It was the best summary he had read of the issues of time release, mercury fillings, in his entire tenure argument with the town trunk. And so he, he said it was fascinating. And that when we sat down yesterday, um, Ann Summers, if I, if I just look under FDA, we'll find um, that, she, that, let me just do this for you. Find F and DA, how about FDA? because Ann called hers the FDA. Oh, look, we have quite a few comments to the FDA, and among them are the definition of an implant, any substance implanted in a natural or man-made body cavity. The dentist asked <coughs> that amalgam not be included as an implant because they understood that when you use natural or man-made body cavity, that could apply to a tooth, although the dentist would actually like to have the teeth outside the mouth. I understand that. But a natural or man-made body cavity in the FDA decided that, no, nah, it's, it's an implant. And that the, so anyway, they're still trying to weasel around that one. How do things just never end? Um, and that you look down here, kind of toward the bottom, and Ann, uh, I, that's Ann Summers. That is absolutely the best summary of the research that I've read that Dr. Summers and the Academy has funded over the last decade, decade and a half on um, mercury fixing bacteria. They, bacteria take mercury and they change it every way from Sunday. They put, they take electrons off of it and make it HG zero. She showed that in a, in a slide at one of her lectures where she had a, a, a solution, an auger solution that contained a little bit of mercury chloride and that where the colonies of the mercury fixing bacteria grew up, there were little round silver droplets of mercury. Dr. Stock can measure those for us. Now, how did they get there? Well, the bacteria took this mercury chloride and said, gee, that's really irritating. Here, let me make you mercury HG0. So it's not so irritating as mercury chloride because they didn't like the chloride. They cleaved the chloride off and added an electron and, hey, it's no charge. So um, Dr. Summers goes through all of the research 
that not only found implanting mercury fillings in teeth creates mercury resistant bacteria, but it also creates antibiotic resistant bacteria because the gene that's necessary for these mercury to these bacteria to resist mercury is the same gene that allows them to resist penicillin. Have you ever heard of anybody dying of an infection that was penicillin resistant? Like many, many people every year die of antibiotic resistant infections. All their favorite antibiotics just don't work. And the reason is very simple, is that the bacteria have been trained to resist those antibiotics by the procedures that the dentist did. But that's okay. That's a systemic disease. It's not my responsibility. I'm not pilot in command. I designated that to, well, the seat was empty. Well, I'm sure I designated it to somebody else. How do I get to be pilot in command? Seems like it might be my fault if that happens. And I don't want it to happen under my watch. I, I don't think that's an appropriate way for me to behave. Um, here's, here's Dr. Fisher again. I'll open that up for you in a second. Here's Kerr. It's really interesting. And uh, Griffin uh, Cole has uh, cited that uh, maybe one of the things that he's going to talk to our academy about. Let me, let me explain briefly about one of the procedures that's uh, in this academy. Is that if you want to get to be a master or uh, even a fellow, that there are certain requirements. And one of them is that you do a, a, a scientific review. And that um, one of the suggestions that I had to Cole was that, uh, Dr. Cole, was that uh, a, a fun lecture that we could probably put together, especially with the help of Dr. Lineback, was the statements of falsehood that keep coming out of the mouths of our professional associations. Information that is factually incorrect. For example, if you go and look at mercury on the internet and you typed in World Health Organization mercury, what you come up with, number one hit on Google is, is the World Health Organization site, mercury uh, criteria document 1 and 1 8, 118. That's the number of the criteria document. And Murray Vimy uh, served on that, on that uh, expert committee in 1990 in Genoa, Italy. And uh, Rod Way Mackert was invited to come to that uh, meeting. And uh, the World Health Organization determined that your predominant source of human exposure to mercury is from in situ dental amalgam. Well, that didn't sit well with the mercury pack and fools. So what they did is they got together with a bunch of the Russian dentists from the World Health Organization at the Federation Dentaire International and a British guy and said, don't you think we ought to issue a statement that says the World Health Organization thinks amalgam is the best thing since sliced bread, and they did. So if you go down to number two or three, you get that statement. World Health Organization says dental amalgam is the best thing since sliced bread. Well, that might cause a conflict in your understanding of the situation, because it seems like we have a conflict between those two statements. And Ulf Benson, who's a nice Swedish fellow and really good on a typewriter, decided to ask the World Health Organization, how come that is? And uh, so he typed out this nice letter, and they said, uh, the official position of the World Health Organization is expressed with a criteria document, and you will find our position have a, has a number after it, and for Mercury, you should look under 118. And he wrote back, and he says, well, thank you very much, but I see another one here that says that you said it's the best thing since sliced, bre sliced bread. And they replied, we didn't say that. Consultants that we've hired have said that. And the official position of the World Health Organization is a criteria document, number 118. And he says, writes another letter. He says, well, you know, I understand there seems to be a conflict here between what this person said and that person said, but I really don't understand how they can come out with a position that represents the World Health Organization. And the reply was, they do not represent our position. Our position is represented by a criteria document, which in the case of Mercury is number 118. They are entitled to their own opinion. So Hardy slipped into that yesterday because he was not familiar with, he hasn't been to enough IOMT meetings to realize that we're actually up against a big evil. They're lying through their teeth. Flat out lying. I call it what it is. It's not appropriate for professionals to go out and deceive other people. And so 
that's what's going on in that situation. Now, if we look at this, uh, Kerr, help me if I create any things that are going to get me arrested, Jim. In um, the lawsuit where Dr. Barnes sued Kerr, he was mercury poisoned, and he sued Kerr and said, you know, I've always purchased these products since dental school. I thought they were fantastic, and now I got this problem. Like, you know, I can't, and, and they're diagnosed as mercury poisoning. And they went to court. And Kerr said, well, of course you're mercury poisoned. It comes with a skull and crossbone on it. You're the one who opened the package. We didn't tell you to buy our product. You opened the package and said if you open the package, you can get poisoned. It says it right there in the material safety data sheet. Causes infertility, birth defects, neurological impairment, too. We said, told you that. And the court said, well, yeah, Dr. Barnes, you're the learned intermediary. <laughs> I, we can't imagine what more. Kerr could have told you that would have been any better told you that you're opening a package of deadly poison. So you get to be murky poison. Tough luck, buddy. Griffin, heads up. Go read what Kerr told the FNDA. Best thing since sliced bread, wonderfully safe. Long track record of use, yada, 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 yada. You wouldn't know that they were dismissed from the lawsuit because, yeah, of course it's supposed to make you poison. That's what it says in the MSDS sheet. They didn't include that information in their FDA comment. We'll include it in ours for them. So let's see if I can find uh, the FD. I want to show you what I did for you. Let's see if this will open with Acrobat, because Acrobat will be a little more fun. Yeah, let's go this way. We'll do it in preview. What do you think? Open, you fool. Ah, there it is. Okay, it's an old version. I don't care. Um, so, Jim put this together, I sent him a lot of stuff, we cannibalized a lot of stuff that the Academy has had, and if you notice, there's a little thing up on the screen there that when I point to the uh, IOMT logo on the first page, a website pops up, and if you click it, you go online. Hello. And so, the way this program allows you to do this is that you can basically read this online and it, you don't need to do that and you can click on the urls and they open up especially if you pay the fee to the hotel and um, <laughs> <coughs> which is quite large i'd rather go to starbucks but anyway the um, so first thing i want to point out is a the links are now hot so instead of just being a piece of paper got hot links. So when somebody says something and they give you a reference and there's a hot link on the bottom, you can go click and go to the PDF or the abstract of that link or the website or the relevant uh, documentation. So this is, this is what we submitted by uh, July 28th. I had to truncate a little trip to Europe in order to get back, but that's okay. It's too damned hot in Europe. Um, and then here are the regulations. And, and all I did is I took what Jim had done, made a table of contents. See, I haven't got the S on the contents. And, um, and this little blue underline indicates that, you know, say for instance, uh, I wanted to see what, that mercury's not locked into the filling. Click on that, and you go to the area where down at the bottom of the page, it says mercury's not locked into the filling. Let's go make it a little larger for you guys in the back row. And it says F and DA, further state, and at the end of each page are what are called end notes. And that uh, Jim likes that, that approach to showing you what's, what's available. And he used at the bottom of each page are the relevant references for everything that we said. And I think there's like 250 of them in this paper, which includes, and we also reference mutter, so we got another 250 and that sort of stuff. So, it's, it's a wonderful, easy way to look at the largest collection of information that Boyd Haley has ever seen in one place. And what's more, 
Subsequent versions of this will include Ann Summers, Vera Sasko, Hans Mutter, remarks as well. And the, Dr. Sysko put in three remarks under three different organizations. So those also will appear. And so let's go back to the, uh, I, I call it the navigation page, if you like. And that's basically uh, one page down. And it's, it's called your table of contents. And on that, you have every single possible t item listed that we might want to look at. Regulations of dental amalgam, the FDA's regulation of implants, <clears throat> even the ruling regarding the, that it was canceled and the, why it must be class three. This is our legal argument that the academy is going to ask for the FDA to respond in an ethical fashion, which they probably won't. It's not in their nature. And that uh, they get too much money from other sources, I think. And, uh, but anyway, as we go down, that oftentimes, like here's Barnes versus Kerr, that might be an interesting thing to look at. That was the one where Kerr said, well, of course you're mercury poisons. It's about 100 pages long, and that uh, we went through, cleaned it up, made it a nice, the text, you can select it and type on it. You know, it's, it's, you can cut, copy and paste with this document now. It's not a picture. Is it, you know, if you understand, PDFs are normally pictures. We've gone through it with a high-end program and turned this into a document. It's a document that you can basically, if you want to write to one of your friends that, uh, and I would, we've got to grow the academy. And what's happening is, is your friends and colleagues, the guy that sat to your left and the girl that sat to your right in dental school, are impaired. And they're impaired and they're lied to and they don't know it. Because there is a constant stream of malarkey coming out of the professional trade associations intended to deceive the public and the profession. So our response is, show me the science. And that here you have a large collection of the science. And so they might be interested in learning that Dr. Barnes, guy about my age, went to dental school and became impaired. They might like to know that some of the other studies, you know, like the uh, question of uh, children. You know, how about children? Are they, are they at risk? Oh no, the American Dental Association took a bunch of children that were orphans and said, well, you know, it's really not a problem. And so, <clears throat> You see, I've got the criteria document there. And, that, uh, and so, guys, would that study be called the Casapia study? Casapia is an orphanage. Do you know that it's unlawful to experiment on orphans? The Office of Human Experimentation says you may not experiment on disadvantaged populations that are not free-willed populations. They cannot make a free choice. And that includes a person that's in prison, even if you pay them. You can't experiment on them. You know, we had lots of experiments back in the 60s where they would pay men to have their gonads irradiated with amounts of radiation that probably caused testicular cancer, definitely caused sterility. And the idea was to see what it took to fry a gonad. <laughs> but they got extra cigarettes. Please understand, they were well paid. And, uh, and because of the Tuskegee experiment, where they prevented African Americans from seeking medical care, actually sent the FBI after a fellow that tried to get to the doctor's office. He didn't think he had bad blood, he thought he might have spirochete. So anyway, that we established certain guidelines that require informed consent. And one, you can't experiment on a disadvantaged or a captive population, that would be an orphanage. And two, you can't do it without telling them what the likely outcome of the experiment would be. At the Casapia experiment, they didn't tell them they were going to put mercury fillings in their teeth. They said they were going to get free dental care. Woohoo! The only place mercury appeared in the informed consent was during the list of tests that they were going to run on the kids. And so let's look at what those tests found. Can you see that from the back of the room? This is exhibit 16. Oops, that's the exhibit 17, 18, 19. Come back here, come back here. Where'd you go, where'd you go? Oh, that's a picture of Mercury. What did I do? 14, oh, 16, I'm sorry, I went the wrong way. Excuse me while I stumble around. 
This is the one of neurological impairment, uh, mercury and chloride, exhibit 16. <clears throat> Notice how the mercury goes up in the children on the first day of the experiment. It starts at about the same, the little lucky little kids that got dental exams and either no fillings or composite fillings and the unlucky little orphans that got mercury in their teeth. At the end of one year, they doubled the amount of mercury that was coming out in the urine. And I'll quote Goldwater from 1957. He said, if we know anything about the toxicology of mercury, we know that there's little relationship between the urinary level of mercury and the uh, evidence of mercury toxicity. Apparently, the dentist doing this had not bothered to read the literature on mercury toxicity, because there's really very seldom any relationship, and I'll show you why. Because as you go across the year three, two, you see that it continued to increase. They received, on average, one additional filling a year. They got two day one, one a year. So by the time year two is there, they should have four fillings. And you notice that they're putting out about four micrograms or three and a half micrograms of mercury. According to Rodway Mackert's estimate, they should have about 0.2 micrograms. I don't think Rodway's right, because there seems to be a few decimal points in the way. <laughs> but Rodway might be right if we go on out to year three, it seems to be declining. Four, it declines some more. Five, six, seven, it continued to decline. And so the, by the end of seven, you notice those little bars? Those are called variations. That there was no statistically significant difference between the kids that had a mouthful of amalgam at year seven, they've got two plus seven, so they got on average nine mercury fillings in their teeth, and the little kids on the bottom had none. And there's no relationship to the amount of mercury coming out in their little wee-wee than there is to the what's in their mouth. And so that's what lets Rodway go around saying, well, it's just an infinitesimal amount. No, it's not. This is proof, exactly like we showed in sheep, that you've damaged the kidneys of the children. I don't think that's an appropriate behavior. It's already been ruled unethical by the Office of Human Experimentation. And yet it's touted by the American Dental Association and the advocates for the continued use of mercury fillings as somehow proving that it's safe. They did a bunch of, they first eliminated all the children that had any neurological impairment, like autism, ADD, ADHD, from the experiment. Let's see, how can you extrapolate from healthy children at the age six and eight to unhealthy children at the age two. We took all those out of the experiment because, you know, they're just wasted human beings. So they are not being forthright with their data because as yet they haven't shown the data from the next uh, experiment where they actually looked at porphyrin profiles. But what did come out in another experiment that was the same data set by James Wood is that if you separate them, boys and girls, and this is Boyd Haley has been saying this for decades, look who got harmed. We should have a profession of women. Guys, bail. <laughs> women are tougher than we are. You wonder why they live longer. Maybe they brush their teeth better. And I contacted Dr. Woods because Dr. Woods in his conclusions of this article said that there was a uh, relationship between the amount of mercury in the urine and uh, the amount of uh, number of fillings in the teeth and uh, over time. And I wrote to him and I said, uh, I, don't, I don't quite understand that uh, statement, Dr. Woods, because uh, as you clearly point out, uh, at least in the male population, by the end of the experiment, uh, there is absolutely no relationship that I can see between the amount of mercury that's coming out of the urine in these children and the uh, level of uh, mercury that you've made, that put in their mouths. And he writes back, thank you for your interest in our study. That point we would make, in, the point that we would make in response to your questions are placement of amalgams increases urinary mercury content, and urinary content does not continue to rise, but instead falls off over time. And then he incorrectly states, after placement ceases or stops. 
It didn't stop. The article itself said it continued throughout the experiment. So still trying to, well, anyway, Dr. Woods is coming to our next meeting. I hope you're coming to San Antonio, because Dr. Woods has agreed to talk to us. And uh, <clears throat> he may want to further elucidate that remark. And so I just want to tell you that in this database, there is an enormous amount of really good information. And that what I'm going to go to now is the next page down. Tonight, there's a special screening immediately after the, the panel forum of our new DVD, Poisoned Horses. And Kim has gobs of bumper stickers that we're going to uh, stick in your hand and uh, make you uh, uh, watch and uh, enjoy. Now, let me start this guy over because you want to hear. This is Let me start this over because you need to hear it from the very beginning. This is a, a meeting that Jeff and I had uh, after almost a year of work. Jeff Green's going to talk to you in just a minute, but after almost a year of work, Jeff and I heard, had a hearing with the board that controls occupational health and safety. And that um, it's a two and a half hour video, so what I've done is I've just taken one little snippet. Eight minutes. It's on YouTube. California Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board has determined that the safety of dental personnel is supposed to be protected by OSHA law. I'm concerned about allegations that an employer group in the state of California is not aware of or not actively pursuing um, following regulations that may exist in the state of California. In general, that an employer may not disclose to their employees the nature of chemicals that those employees may be exposed to and the hazards that are associated with them, consistent with California regulations. I'm concerned that an employer may choose to engage in practices that expose their employees to higher levels of those chemicals. That
necessary to do things like industrial hygiene monitoring within the workplace, does your trade association get involved in assisting and facilitating gathering the data that would be helpful and explaining what methods may be necessary in order to control exposures that may occur in the workplace? We did that most recently with the leader of the hike issue. Um, in general, we have uh, discouraged the use of leader of the hike in the office. But well, going back to mercury, have yeah. you done any monitoring of mercury and on, on that side of this puzzle? Um, frankly, the monitoring on the mercury, it hasn't come up on our, our radar. I mean, they claim that the, the science has been there, but um, there's not a splash made. There isn't a warning. There aren't warning signs. There aren't cases. It just hasn't come up. And I've been with CDA for 13 years. Um, I'm not aware that there were uh, workers' comp cases. CDA, as a professional association, has relationships with professional liability insurance companies. engineering controls, personal protection. 
been exposed to mercury without your permission, contact the number on the screen. Come on up, Jeff. Jeff's going to explain to you what we asked him that got him so excited. Follow the IAMT protocols. It's the law. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff Green. I'm, most people think of me as the fluoride guy, despite the fact that I actually work on safe drinking water issues. But for those of you who don't know me more personally, actually in 1984, I've been a management consultant for health professionals and I had about 400 dental offices as, as clients. And in 1984, I, I basically put my foot in my mouth and quit working with any dentist that was working with mercury anymore, which at that particular time meant that it reduced almost everybody on the areas that I was living anyway. So in, what happened was is that uh, um, Charlie Brown, Consumers for Dental Choice, um, had gone to both New Jersey and was now heading towards uh, California, asking that OSHA, uh, on behalf of employees, basically ban uh, mercury amalgams. And when I understood that that was going on, I actually kind of got in the middle of that, thinking that OSHA doesn't really have the capacity to ban uh, mercury amalgams. That uh, FDA could possibly, but OSHA doesn't have that capacity. They don't have that authority to be able to do it. So we actually bifurcated a petition, and on behalf of the International Academy of World Medicine and Toxicology, um, David Kennedy, uh, Chet Yokoyama, who uh, was a previous uh, board member for the uh, Dental Health Board, uh, excuse me, the uh, Dental Board in, in California, and myself representing about 400 dental offices, we filed a petition. And the petition that we, we filed was not about banning, it was basically to, if you want to call it instruct, because that's partly what we had to do with this particular board, is to instruct them that they didn't need to get into the question about whether, whether placing mercury amalgams was good or bad, that even if you banned it right this minute, we'd still have <coughs> arguably 80, 100 years worth of, of um, time when actually dentists were going to have to be taking mercury amalgams out, and that we still had exposures, and that the employees were still exposed at this particular point. And so we started off with the idea that we didn't really want them, in our particular petition, we didn't really want them to make a decision about whether to ban or not. We needed protective um, we need protection, basically. Um, so we basically provided a couple things. Obviously, it was a longer document, but the first one was to include evidence of reproductive harm. And for those of you who do not know, the mercury workplace, uh, the vapors and the protection against uh, for, for employees is based on tremors. And for the most part, any of the testing that's been done, and they didn't, I don't know if she described that there were only 14 over the last 20 years, there's only been 14 samples ever taken in the dental office in the state of California on, on how much mercury vapor were there, but they were all time-weighted average, which I'm going to get to in a second. But the time-weighted average was based on the fact that at the end of eight hours, are you going like this? That's basically the standard, and that's what it's been set up for. So we basically put in the scientific evidence that uh, the International Academy of World Medicine and Toxicology has already gathered and so forth, and placed that in there in terms of reproductive harm and what was happening actually in the... Uh, in, in Norway as well, as well. And then the second thing is we asked them to institute what they call engineering controls and work practice controls uh, for protection of the employees. This was, in essence, the IOMT uh, preferred approach so far as protections. Sometimes the word engineering controls and, and work practice controls get confusing. Engineering controls, in their terms, even though they use them widely also, basically means don't, don't have the exposure. And those would typically mean using water or using a vacuum in which there wasn't any exposure to the employee at all. Work practice controls would mean don't, um, don't use a cavitron on top of, a, of an amalgam where that you actually you know, create the vapor itself. And then there's other ones they call protections, which would have to do with the clothing and other things that you're using. Um, so we provided them with very specific guidelines for that. But we also basically said the, our approach was that that they, we needed something to stimulate them to participate with us. And what we basically said was that without enforcement, if we were just using voluntary, it would mean that those individuals who are following the standards have an un, undue burden and an unfair com competitive uh, process going on by which if they were trying to hire someone and you're actually getting true informed consent, you're telling somebody right from the very beginning, you are going to work in a place where it's likely that you could be harmed unless you do this, 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 and this. And then Second of all, it also means that, so one, we would have to worry about in what we would think of as being uh, employees and being able to gather employees, and the second part is patients themselves are looking at uh, what kind of protections you're wearing, and in another office they say, well, we don't do that kind of thing. So we basically were approaching it saying that 
we were looking for information based on voluntary compliance, but more specifically, we were also looking for enforcement to even the playing field so that it would, so that everybody was operating under the same uh, competitive process. Um, we basically said that the current standards were not sufficient, one for voluntary implementation. And I just have to tell you flat out, the reason we're talking about Cal OSHA, but it, it, what we found out is it's true in virtually every state, that there are laws that are similar to these laws, that they ask for the same things because some of the standards are set by the national, by U.S., in which they can't, the standards in your particular state can't be any less restrictive. And so because of that, the ceiling limits we're going to talk about in a, in a minute apply to all of you. And so what we basically said was voluntary implementation. And what we did is we looked at, at the citations that they gave us that said that, that the um, ordinances, or excuse me, the regulations were already there. Well, it doesn't say anything about mercury where you're reading. It doesn't say anything about dentistry. It doesn't say, I mean, it would be impossible if they hadn't told us ahead of time. And unless you were an industrial hygienist, you wouldn't know that it applied to you. And so I would suggest to you that's probably most of you have never even seen this, you know, the requirements in OSHA in your own particular state based upon uh, airborne aspects of it. Second part was enforcement. The other one was warning or informed consent. Um, they didn't even know what they should be putting in an informed consent. And so we found that even the agency itself didn't know what they're talking about. And then the last part about it was is that uh, even the gloves and the rest, as David said earlier, that, they, that the standards that they did set were not protective of mercury vapors. So we were in disagreement with some of the response to this. But here's what, I mean, we also obviously made a statement that said that this, the California Dental Association and American Dental Association discouraged having any monitoring devices in the office. And for those of you who haven't seen that, for the longest time, I've known dentists who have Jerome, um, you know, measurement devices and, you know, they never kept them in their office because there was a feeling that if they kept them in the office that they'd be telling um, patients that they had overexposures and that they'd be making medical decisions for them somehow. So, um, Maybe should have, have it asked, should start with this as a, so I can do this more briefly. How many of you know in, who in your office is responsible for OSHA requirements? How many of you know in your office who's responsible for it? Okay. How many of you have had either a Jerome, and I'm not taking names, how many of you have had a Jerome or some other kind of measurement device or an industrial hygienist come in and measure actually mercury vapors? Can I have a show, show of hands? Okay, not very many, but there are some. Okay, so one of the big differences here, and what's what's happened here is that if you saw what happened, is they were incredulous that an entire industry has been ignoring this. They were not persuaded that the California Dental Association, even though this is a snippet, they weren't persuaded that the California Dental Association had any real, honest at attempt at it. And so that was part of their statement was is that they ruled that the that it was basically enforcement. If we had enforcement, it would work. But they also believed that it should be the trade associations. They were out there teaching everybody what to do with this and that they themselves didn't feel like it was a responsibility of uh, basically agencies to go out and tell everybody what their job was. They're thinking everybody, if you're an employer, you're supposed to know this stuff already. So this is one of the most important aspects of what came out of this. And this is actually a quotation from, the, from an actual um, CCR, it's Title VIII, it's a section. And basically what it says, whenever it is reasonable to, to suspect and so we had a lot of discussions about when is it reasonable to suspect that you're going to have mercury vapors and that, that it's something that you should measure. And what I'm saying to you is this is also a reflection of what happens on the U.S. requirements, which again would be applied to every state. And what it's really saying is, is that you as a workplace, as a dental, somebody who is a, a dental employer, have a responsibility to measure and to find out what those measurements are. And from my perspective, we claimed to Cal OSHA that this wasn't happening. And this wasn't happening virtually everywhere. Um, another part is that here's, the, here's something we actually provided to them. We provided to them some historical measurements. And I put it up here without some of the values on there for you, for you to take a couple moments just to kind of read through on your own down through the list. And imagine for yourself, if you haven't measured these, what do you think those measurements are? What do you think they are for trituration? Meaning that it's not an open capsule. How much exposure do you think you have in your office from that? How much from opening the capsule? Hopefully some of you have been around for a while have already heard some of, the, some of the numbers. How about autoclaving? How about, you know, the rest of these? And if you can just look down and just kind of think for yourself before, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on another, another numbers here. Oral aspirator, 265, trituration, 50, meaning not even opening the capsule. You already have exposures that are half of what is required or half of what is allowed. Uh, opening a capsule, 1,000. 
if you're opening several capsules to actually do amalgams, those people who are using amalgam, not here necessarily in your, your offices, but they may have 2,000 parts per million and uh, just, just from that alone. Aut autoclaving, 150. A lot of people probably should be concerned about the fact that even polishing is 100. Okay, 2,000 if you're drilling high and dry, and I know most people don't attempt to do that, but on the other hand, some people still do, and you don't have a law that keeps you from doing that. We don't have numbers for Cavitron, and we don't have numbers for amalgam removal because it still comes down to how do they do it. If you break it up into a whole bunch of parts, as you've all learned already, you're going to have a lot more exposure than you do otherwise. And so hopefully fairly soon we'll actually have some even more uh, specific numbers that are also tagged along with some filming done for part of that. Hopefully uh, uh, David Workman and some other people will work on that where we can actually get numbers where you can actually see them when it's actually occurring. Okay, next part, permissible exposure limits. There's three areas that we have to look at. One's a ceiling limit, another one's a time-weighted average over eight hours, and another one is a short-term exposure limit over 15 minutes. Everybody in the, in the California Dental Association would try to force everybody into the time-weighted average because it's so hard to, to measure and so hard to monitor and, and in fact uh, it probably won't get done if, it, if that was the, the focus. But if you notice on the film they were talking about a ceiling limit, it's just really looking, it's measuring. It's not a, it doesn't take a study, it's a measurement that happens right at that minute. What is the number? 100 parts per million. Okay, and as you see right there, the state standards have to be at least that restrictive. There may be some that have lower, I don't know all of them. And the employer must establish controls to protect. If you have anything over 100 parts per million, then you have to start using protective devices. Hang on just one second, if you don't mind. Um, employees right to know, David may have mentioned this earlier, 19, uh, 1987, it has to be at least as uh, complete as the MSDS, the Manufacturer Safety Data Sheet. And the uh, second part of it is even though there might be some, um, some, some uh, concern about different states of whether it have to be a signature on the bottom for an informed consent, the one thing that we found is going to be true across the entire United States is there has to be training on how to handle materials. And that there, and, and probably most of you aren't doing that, but there has to be a training process on handling, how to handle materials. It has to be documented. It has to be something that uh, enforcement could come in and actually take a look at. And in fact, what has to happen is, is that uh, if they do any kind of a, a review, it, it, they actually ask the person, when did you take it, what did you learn, what did you see, that kind of a thing. And so we find that that's necessary. This is the last part of it, and that's the record of monitoring during the last 30 years. Every exposure that exceeds that 100 parts per million is supposed to have, it's supposed to be monitored, and it's supposed to be logged, and it's, you're supposed to keep those records for 30 years. So this is real different. Um, at any rate, that's what we did with the part of it. I would suggest to you, first of all, this is not only what we accomplished with this, but we believe that it can be done in virtually every state. And so the first thing we did is went in and said, well, we want, we'd like to look at voluntary compliance. How can this particular trade association provide information to their, own, to their own membership? And then second of all, how can we now encourage more people to follow through with this? So thank you very much.